Welcome to India, the world's fifth largest economy and the most densely populated country on the planet. India's formidable workforce plays a significant role in establishing it as a powerhouse in the global economy. While numerous nations grapple with aging populations and skill sets that may not align with current demands, with over 65% of its population below 35, India boasts a youthful and highly efficient workforce. The question is, can India replace China? India's opportunity lies in the shifting world's factory floor. Rising labor costs in China have multinationals glancing eastward. India's young, tech-savvy workforce beckons. The Make in India campaign echoes across the country. The strength of this workforce has empowered the economy to seize opportunities from global events that may appear as challenges to others. Over the past five years, India has garnered attention for securing numerous manufacturing jobs that were traditionally associated with China. In the current landscape, with China's era of rapid economic expansion seemingly tapering off, it appears that India is poised to step into the spotlight as the potential new global workshop, reaping the economic benefits that accompany such a role. This prospect aligns with the Indian government's ambition to achieve a $5 trillion economy by the conclusion of 2025 has demonstrated remarkable growth. With a modest $4,112 billion GDP, its growth is the impressive 7% GDP growth in the fiscal year 2023 to 2024. This growth showcases the resilience and potential of the Indian economy in navigating global challenges. In contrast, China boasts a $18,566 billion GDP, standing tall as the world's second largest economy. While celebrating this economic prowess, it's crucial to delve into the intricacies. India's GDP per capita, ranking 140th in 2023, however, there is still a considerable journey ahead. India's per capita output is currently only one-fifth of China's, highlighting the substantial gap that needs to be bridged. Despite China's achievements over the past three decades, it is important to note that it is not yet considered a wealthy nation. Nonetheless, the progress in both these countries holds the potential to bring about significant positive impacts on a humanitarian scale. Despite the geopolitical challenges arising from China's economic expansion, it has played a crucial role in elevating hundreds of millions of people from poverty, a commendable achievement. This positive transformation is a potential blueprint that India could follow. The question arises, could India emerge as the next economic superpower, rivaling China and the USA? To answer this, we must examine the advantages that India could leverage to propel its economy to such heights and identify the challenges that may impede its progress. This video will delve into these inquiries, so be sure to stay tuned until the conclusion for a comprehensive exploration of the topic. In the early 1990s, India's economy changed a lot, similar to what happened in China. India was in big financial trouble and barely avoided going bankrupt by getting a loan from the IMF. The Washington Consensus brought important changes, like getting rid of rules that protected Indian businesses too much. Protectionist policies try to help local businesses, but can make things more expensive for regular people. Import taxes raise prices and create a choice between what's affordable and what's made in India. In specific industries, particularly those with significant employment potential or broader economic advantages beyond mere financial gains, such protectionist measures may be deemed valuable. The trade-off involves accepting higher prices in exchange for increased employment opportunities and enhanced self-sufficiency. However, the consequence is a reduced cost competitiveness of these goods, leading to noticeable price inflation within domestic markets. The repercussions of trade restrictions are currently evident in our global landscape, particularly with Russian sanctions and the ongoing China trade war. While these examples represent extreme cases, the underlying process is essentially the same. Economies can manage higher prices within reasonable limits. If the assessment of an economy is solely based on the affordability of goods, then Somalia would emerge as the world's preeminent superpower. This underscores the importance of considering a broader spectrum of economic factors beyond just the cost of goods. 
However, what becomes challenging for economies is the impact of artificially inflated prices on their export competitiveness, constituting the second major issue arising from protectionist policies and trade restrictions. A car manufacturer producing subpar products that find a market only domestically due to substantial taxes on competitors may struggle to promote their cars in the international arena where a level playing field is absent. This discrepancy hampers their ability to compete effectively beyond their protected domestic market. This implies that the economy is missing the opportunity to establish an export market which has the potential to generate more long-term employment than what protectionist policies might save. A viable alternative to avoid these issues is to protect local industries through methods that do not penalize imports. Instead, the government can opt to support local manufacturers through grants, tax breaks, direct payments, or guaranteed purchases, fostering a more sustainable and globally competitive economic environment. An exemplary case of this approach is evident in the United States, where farmers receive subsidies to uphold the local agriculture industry. This support is driven not only by the employment opportunities it provides, but also by the strategic advantage of independently ensuring the food supply for the population. While subsidy-based protectionist policies may not directly escalate prices for consumers, they necessitate government expenditure instead of revenue generation through import taxes. Consequently, the eventual burden falls on taxpayers, who are required to cover the incurred costs. Regardless of the method chosen, be it increased taxes or elevated prices, protectionist policies constitute a form of direct intervention in the free market. Any such intervention inevitably introduces inefficiencies. This is why, as a general trend, economies often experience growth when they adopt a more open stance towards free trade, allowing market forces to operate with fewer restrictions and fostering greater efficiency. To be fair, the inefficiencies stemming from protectionist trade policies in India were relatively minor when juxtaposed with the substantial strain on the economy, induced by extensive government intervention in nearly all business activities. As previously noted, India, in the decades following independence, drew substantial inspiration from the Soviet Union's command-style planned economy, contributing to a complex and heavily regulated business environment. The economy operated under a framework of five-year plans that aimed to focus on specific industries such as agriculture and heavy manufacturing. While not an exact replica, this approach allowed for the existence of private industry but subjected it to stringent regulations. The landscape was dominated by large, heavily subsidized state-owned companies, creating significant barriers for private enterprises to compete, not only in major industries but also in smaller markets. Initiating a business, even as small as a corner store, faced almost insurmountable challenges. This situation arose due to the implementation of something referred to as the License Raj or Permit Raj, which was in effect from the 1950s until the early 1990s. This system involved stringent licensing, extensive regulation, and bureaucratic red tape that businesses were obligated to navigate in order to operate in India. It's important to note that the term License Raj was not an official designation. Rather, it was a descriptor applied to convey the extreme degree of government control over business activities, drawing a parallel to the British Raj as another oppressive ruling system. While the term may seem like a tasteless joke, it has become a commonly used descriptor for this period. Moving on, business regulation and licensing are not unique to India, and in many instances, such regulations play a crucial role in ensuring competence and safety especially in sensitive fields like healthcare, where you wouldn't want just anybody setting up a doctor's office and performing surgeries. However, in India's context, these regulations extended beyond ensuring business competency and safety. These regulations extended their reach into all facets of business operations, becoming excessively redundant. Depending on the nature of the business, as many as 80 distinct government agencies had to be appeased before a business could commence production. Furthermore, businesses had to navigate this complex web of regulations to ensure the continuous operation of their ventures. 
This system of licenses and regulations posed a significant barrier for small businesses attempting to start, as it was virtually impossible for an average individual to navigate without the assistance of a team of lawyers. The complexity and cost involved in compliance deterred most people from even attempting to establish a business. In reality, the only feasible method to bypass the licensing Raj was to operate a business informally and unofficially, evading the formal regulatory framework. When faced with law enforcement, individuals often found it more cost-effective and straightforward to pay a bribe rather than going through the proper channels for compliance. While this approach may have sufficed for smaller businesses operating discreetly, it dissuaded large international companies from considering India as a viable center of operations. The excessive complexities and challenges associated with compliance made the business environment in India unattractive and impractical for significant international enterprises. I've dedicated a significant portion of this discussion to systems that were dismantled over three decades ago because they demonstrated the transformative potential of India. Merely removing economic restrictions does not automatically propel an economy forward. Examining the experiences of countries like Russia, which witnessed a substantial decline in GDP after the collapse of the Soviet Union, despite transitioning to free market systems, highlights that the path to economic growth involves more than just liberalizing the market. Since 1991, and notably since 2000, India has experienced a robust growth trajectory essentially doubling in size every five years. Much of this success can be attributed to the absence of stringent government restrictions, making India an attractive destination for business for several crucial reasons. Notably, it is the second largest English-speaking nation globally, with a substantial 135 million English speakers. This holds significant importance for many companies as international business agreements are predominantly conducted in English as a neutral language. In the 1990s and 2000s, this linguistic advantage was primarily leveraged to establish cost-saving call centers. You've likely experienced calling a company and being connected with someone in India, illustrating how this linguistic proficiency has been strategically employed in the business landscape. While it may not sound glamorous, Call center jobs have generated substantial value for the country. Economics, fundamentally, is an exploration of how individuals engage with valuable entities. On a macro scale, this prompts questions about how systems contribute or detract value from the national or even global economy. Countries can enhance value by extracting raw materials like resources, a process often involving the extraction of materials from the ground. While this method generates substantial wealth, it is inherently unsustainable as the resources will eventually deplete. Resource extraction typically demands minimal manpower, resulting in high profit margins and an elevated risk of exploitation by the ruling class and certain fossil fuel companies. Examining the list of the world's most oil-rich countries reveals that natural resource wealth does not automatically translate to economic prosperity. Alternatively, countries can enhance value by importing raw materials and transforming them into components or end products through manufacturing. Manufacturing is particularly beneficial for economic well-being, as it typically involves a higher manpower requirement per unit of value output when compared to most natural resource extraction processes. This translates to more job opportunities distributed among a larger population, fostering the creation of a middle class that makes blatant exploitation more challenging. Manufacturing proves to be more sustainable than resource extraction, as it isn't reliant on depleting finite resources. If a country maintains a consistent flow of material imports and experiences steady international demand for the products it manufactures, the income from this sector could be sustained almost indefinitely. Regrettably, the real world doesn't always align with this ideal scenario, and economies centered around manufacturing are vulnerable to international economic conditions, both in terms of material imports and product exports. Relying solely on manufacturing, without incorporating more advanced services such as research and development, design and marketing, can result in a continual competition to reduce costs, often leading to a race to the bottom. Companies such as Apple, Samsung, Microsoft, Amazon and Intel frequently outsource from India. 
drawn by the presence of skilled labor and favorable business conditions. However, establishing an economy solely reliant on an industry that thrives when the workforce is paid minimal wages and companies operate with minimal constraints is almost as unsustainable as relying solely on resource extraction. It introduces challenges related to fair labor practices and environmental sustainability. Outsourced manufacturing can serve as a transitional industry towards an economy predominantly driven by services. Across the globe, advanced economies predominantly derive a majority of their output from services, encompassing a diverse range from schools to banks. If a sector in the economy is contributing value without relying on extracting resources or factory production, it is likely to fall under the broad category of the service sector. The service sector is pivotal for advanced economies, offering sustainability and potential profitability for other sectors. Consider two countries, both with a single factory. One focuses exclusively on manufacturing, attracting international business due to low wages, but faces the risk of demands for higher wages as its workforce becomes wealthier. In contrast, the second country has a robust service sector with in-house R&D, design and marketing, creating superior products and commanding premium prices. Despite the service sector driving value creation, the entire economy's incomes rise, leading to higher wages for manufacturing employees involved in crafting intricate, value-added products. While basic manufacturing of items like knives and forks yields inherent value, there are limitations due to global competition. However, utilizing the service sector to design innovative products from the same materials allows for higher pricing, making factory workers' wages a smaller concern in the final product's overall price. Goods manufactured in advanced economies such as Europe or America are often perceived as of higher quality, and this perception is usually accurate. It's not a reflection of inherently inferior manufacturing in countries like China or India. Rather, it stems from the economic rationale. In advanced economies, it makes more sense to manufacture high-quality items, as the goods that sell primarily due to their low cost would not be as inexpensive as those produced in other countries. This connection between quality manufacturing, service sector development, and the potential for economic growth is relevant to India's future prospects. Due to its distinctive demographics, India has the opportunity to bypass the conventional slow economic progression that most economies experience as they transition from underdeveloped to developing, and ultimately to advanced status. The strategic integration of its manufacturing and service sectors could accelerate its economic development. It's important to acknowledge that predicting the future, especially in the field of economics, is inherently uncertain. However, delving into this scenario for India is worthwhile because even if it doesn't unfold as envisioned, it serves as a compelling case study on the comparative advantages of economies. While many consider China to be India's primary global rival, the reality might be more nuanced than such a straightforward comparison suggests. India and China are likely to compete in different markets, considering the challenges of outsourcing services to China. Apart from the sovereign risks associated with China, especially in recent times, a significant portion of the population does not speak English. Additionally, their business culture diverges considerably from that of the West, making it challenging for certain types of services to be effectively outsourced to China. Since the dismantling of trade restrictions and the licensing Raj in the early 1990s, India has emerged as an excellent destination for outsourcing services. This brings us back to the example of call centers. If we were to draw a direct comparison between call centers in India and factory floors in China, these two industries might appear quite similar in terms of their contribution to the respective economies. Both industries, call centers and factory floors, share commonalities in that they offer relatively low wages and primarily serve the interests of foreign companies. These sectors can be likened to entry-level jobs in the global economic landscape. To draw an analogy, the factory floor corresponds to an entry-level job at a fast food restaurant while call centers equate to entry-level positions at the global headquarters of a Fortune 500 company. Factory floor jobs encounter challenges transitioning beyond the factory, while even basic roles in the service sector are adaptable, 
allowing progression into higher value-adding positions through training and experience. Indian companies showcase this evolution with diverse, complex services beyond call centers, attracting global attention for professional services like accounting, engineering, design, and legal services. India's unique capacity to evolve into a service sector hub positions it as a potential economic powerhouse, gaining manufacturing work from China due to cost-effective manpower. Yet, alongside this optimism, it's essential to consider challenges and risks. The 2020 economic contraction, primarily due to the global impact of COVID-19, highlighted vulnerabilities. Even before the pandemic, signs of growth slowdown existed, attributed to a dual perception of India's economy as both over-regulated and under-regulated, contributing to the deceleration. Despite the reforms initiated in the early 1990s, remnants of government bureaucracy persisted, particularly in the financial sector. As of today, the largest banks in India are state-owned and operated. These state-run banks have been criticized for their slow pace in extending credit to businesses and consumers. This sluggish credit flow hinders the realization of innovative ideas, making it challenging for entrepreneurs to launch new ventures. Additionally, it restrains consumer spending, as obtaining loans for significant expenses like homes, cars or education becomes a cumbersome process. Government regulation in India has been implemented inconsistently, leading to challenges. In 2020, a significant decision to deregulate the agricultural industry was reversed due to vehement opposition from farmers. The reversal stemmed from concerns among farmers who feared that without government-guaranteed prices, their profitability would be jeopardized. This incident highlights the complex dynamics and challenges associated with regulatory decisions in the country. It's essential to note that the reversal in the agricultural industry represents a form of protectionist trade intervention, reminiscent of the policies that impeded economic growth before the 1990s. Another instance of government intervention and overreach occurred when the government decided to render certain denominations of currency unusable after a set date, a move implemented with a mere two months' notice. Such decisions can have significant economic repercussions, impacting various sectors and disrupting the normal flow of transactions. The decision to render certain currency denominations unusable created a rush as people hurried to deposit these notes at banks before they became obsolete. This resulted in long lines and significant lost man hours. Beyond the immediate inconveniences, it raised substantial doubts about the stability of the nation's currency. The credibility of a currency relies on public trust, and the government's abrupt move to eliminate specific denominations without adequate notice raised concerns about the security of conducting substantial business transactions in Indian rupees. As unconventional as the demonetization measure may sound, the government deemed it necessary due to lingering effects from the era of the license Raj. Many businesses had chosen to operate outside official government control. In 2018, Informal grey market businesses, according to various estimates, accounted for more than half of India's total output. The move aimed to bring such businesses into the formal economy and enhance transparency, although its implementation and the resulting challenges stirred significant debate and scepticism. Attempting to collect taxes from informal businesses and workers poses considerable challenges. The government's strategy through demonetization aimed to compel individuals to deposit their cash, hoping this would lead to greater income reporting and tax compliance. However, the intended outcomes were not fully realized. The initiative did, however, bring attention to the pervasive issue of the informal economy. Many workers are hesitant to transition into more formal value-adding roles due to concerns about taxation, which could result in lower net income compared to working in informal cash-based jobs. This underscores the complexities and barriers associated with formalizing the economy. Large multinational corporations typically operate in a formalized manner, avoiding cash-based transactions. Consequently, some companies are facing unexpected challenges in attracting labor in a country with a population of almost one and a half billion people. The divide between the formal and informal sectors raises concerns about the emergence of a two-speed economy. Skilled workers proficient in English could form a distinct class, 
earning significantly more than the rest of the population engaged in the informal economy. This disparity poses potential social and economic challenges, further emphasizing the need for comprehensive strategies to bridge this gap. Although the shift between formal and informal sectors might not immediately affect headline GDP figures, the primary goal of pursuing economic growth is to enhance the living standards of the participants in that economy. Encouragingly, a report from the State Bank of India indicates a positive trend. The informal economy, which constituted 52% of the total economic output in 2018, has reportedly reduced to just 20% in 2021. This suggests progress in the formalization of the economy, potentially leading to improved transparency, tax compliance, and overall economic stability. The reduction in the informal economy, as reported by the State Bank of India, can be attributed to a combination of government initiatives aimed at facilitating legitimate work and business operations. Additionally, the impact of the COVID-19 outbreaks played a role as many informal workers found themselves out of business. In contrast, their counterparts in the formal economy had the flexibility to work from home or operate from controlled office environments, demonstrating how external factors can influence the dynamics between formal and informal sectors. India's economy is characterized by immense potential. With a youthful and skilled population, it is well positioned to leverage the stagnation of China and transition seamlessly into industries that might pose challenges for other developing economies. The critical factor influencing India's economic trajectory will be the government's ability to assure businesses and investors that the country is both a secure and profitable investment destination. Simultaneously, it hinges on providing the population with the necessary financial tools to achieve individual wealth growth, contributing to the collective prosperity of the nation. The alignment of these factors will play a pivotal role in shaping India's economic future. Certainly. Now, let's delve into the statistics for India, currently the world's fifth largest economy. In terms of size, India boasts a GDP of $4.1 trillion, positioning it behind only the United States, China, Japan and Germany in the global economic landscape. The noteworthy GDP figure for India is distributed across its expansive population, resulting in a GDP per capita of $2,845. This places India in the lower quartile among global economies in terms of per capita income. However, the positive aspect lies in its sustained growth rate. Over the past three decades, India's economy has demonstrated consistent growth, with its size approximately doubling every five years. This growth trajectory underscores the resilience and dynamism of India's economic landscape. Shifting our gaze to the labour market, unemployment at 10.09% in October 2023 poses a challenge. Balancing economic growth with job creation is a delicate task, requiring strategic policies to foster employment opportunities. Despite India's economic prowess, international organizations remain somewhat tentative about engaging with the country, given its track record of making unconventional industry-changing decisions. The presence of a substantial informal economy and the influence exerted by state-owned companies also contribute to challenges and uncertainties in the business environment. These factors can impact the perception of stability and predictability for businesses and investors considering involvement with India. In the realm of industry, India harbors immense potential, as explored in this video. However, the full realization of this potential is yet to be achieved. While India has the capacity to become the world's largest economy, it cannot be overlooked that the average citizen currently experiences relatively low economic well-being on a global scale. This discrepancy is attributed to the underutilization of the country's capabilities, hindering the production of as much value as it could potentially generate. Addressing these challenges is crucial for India to unlock its full economic potential and improve the living standards of its citizens. Thanks for watching. You're welcome. If you have any question, feel free to ask. Goodbye.